Let's continue to worship our God as we pray to him. Bring our needs before him. Let's pray. Oh, blessed God in heaven, we pray to you, for you are a God who abounds with love and kindness, with mercy and grace. And we pray, O oh God, for the place where you have placed us, for this city of Sunderland. We plead with you, O oh God, that you would look down with pity upon the people. Lord, we know that this is a poor part of England. <clears throat> and as the people that we hear reported in the news struggle through the winter time, the people here will struggle a great deal. Lord, we pray for them, and we ask that you would provide, that you would shower them, O oh God, with all that they need, that you would feed their families, that you would warm their homes, that you would take away their worries and their fears. We pray, O oh Lord, that the new year <coughs> would bring a brighter day for the people of Sunderland, that you would revive the economy here, that you would create opportunities to work, and that you would motivate the people to work. And then we pray that as you bless them, as you care for them, that they would look to you as their great protector and that they would seek you and that they would find you in Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that this coming Christmas season would be an opportunity that you would work, Lord, through the churches of the city, through all of the churches here who put on carol services and who'll meet on Christmas Day and other services around, O oh Lord, and seek to talk of the hope of Jesus Christ, of the incarnation, of the forgiveness of sins, of blessing for the life now, and of greater blessing for the future. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would draw many in this city to you. Lord, we plead with you for our own church. We ask that you would bring in the stranger and the foreigner, that you would bring in the widow and the orphan, and that we would be a family to them that Christ would be an older brother to them and that God would be a father to them. We pray, O oh Lord, that they would find all consolation in him, that they would come with tears of penitence and tears of joy and that they would be welcomed into your church. And we ask and plead, O oh God, that we would have baptisms in the year ahead, that our church would grow, that all of the churches in this city would continue to grow. We pray, O oh Lord, that we as a people will be made ready for the influx of souls, that you would help us to prepare our hearts aright, that we would humble ourselves before you. Father, you give us every reason to praise, and yet we are found cursing and complaining. Lord, you give us every reason to gather with strength for worship and prayer, and yet our numbers are few. Oh God, we pray that you would revive our faith. We pray, O oh Lord, that your Spirit poured out on the church at Pentecost would come with great strength and that he would revive your work in our hearts and in our congregation, that we would be a righteous and faithful people, that we would be a love-filled people. O oh God, we pray that you would be present in our lives, in our families, and in our church. We pray, Lord, that you would be hallowed, that your name and that your word and your ways would be holy and sacred to us, and that we would hate, O oh Lord, our sin, and that we would hate our unbelief, and that we would turn from it and run to you, and that we would be welcomed. O oh Lord, help us to come like the prodigal son again, and know that you are always ready to receive us, always ready to fill us and to clothe us, and to make merry and to sing over us. Let us run to you and receive of your grace and receive of your truth and walk in your ways this day. O oh Lord, we pray that you would work through the means, that you would answer our prayers, that you would feed us in the word, and that you would speak to us, Lord, when we hear the word of God preached. We pray that Jesus, the good shepherd, would be shepherding us and we pray, Lord, for the whole church who meets today. We pray, Lord, that you would give them fresh love for their Savior. O oh Lord, revive our spirits, refresh us, and drive out the sin from our midst. We pray for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So we're going to turn now to God's word. To Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 20. Oh, Thomas, I didn't see you. Hello. Luke chapter 6. I'll start from verse 12. I know we've had two sermons since then, but we'll start in verse 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, (coughs) he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes (laughs) towards his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Amen. I wonder what you thought being a Christian would be like, what you expected it to be like. You know, there are some people who uh, believe that you know with prayer and faith they can they can make their lives perfect and easy now they can pray away any of their troubles and there are people who fill churches with that kind of philosophy but however well intentioned um, it is it it ultimately kills faith because sooner or later we realize that the reality of the Christian life doesn't match the dream that is espoused by such people but don't we do the same We don't have the same kind of extreme philosophy as some of our charismatic friends. But nevertheless, we keep expecting things to be different. We keep expecting things to be better for us, things to be brighter. We're told that we are to take up a cross and follow after Jesus. But nevertheless, when the cross comes, we don't like it. And, of course, we begin to think maybe maybe we're not. Christians. We're left in that dark and cold place of abandonment. We begin to doubt whether we have any true faith, whether God loves us, whether God has saved us. Of course, the church has found itself in that place many times, and especially in the early centuries. And uh, here Jesus teaches, and Luke reminds us that our way is the way of the cross but also that the way of the cross is the blessed way. So first, our way. What are our lives going to be like as the people of God? Right? Now, keep in mind the expectation. Remember, we've just covered uh, in the last section 
that all kinds of people went up the mountain to see Jesus, and they were healed of all of their diseases, and the evil spirits who tormented them were driven out as, as power went out from Jesus. And so for those people, their, their lives were really quite miserable, but having come to Jesus uh, and receiving that sign that pointed to him as Messiah, immediately there's, there's a remedy for them and their lives are made better. And so now Jesus stands up and he begins speaking about the life that lies ahead of them. And you can imagine them thinking, well, if that was the starter, what's the main course going to be like for us? <laughs> if that was just the beginning, what's the middle going to be? And we've also said that Jesus is uh, the new Moses. I've made that point many times, but here is another confirmation. Just as Moses uh, prepared the people crossing over the River Jordan, as we read earlier, and he said, when you cross over, you're to stand on two mountains, on Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, one to pronounce blessing on the people for obedience, the other to pronounce curses on the people for their disobedience. Now, Jesus stands on the mountainside, the new Moses and he proclaims what approximates to blessing and to curse. And so here is an incredible moment in the history of the world. Salvation is being unfolded before the people's eyes. These ordinary people who have been overlooked by the world, and they're thinking, finally, we're going to be vindicated. Finally, we're going to be exalted. Finally, all of our woes are going to be taken away. But then Jesus begins teaching. And whereas Moses blesses, and you can go back and you can read it in Deuteronomy 28, that you will be blessed in the ground, and you'll be blessed in the kneading bowl, and you'll be blessed in the womb, and your enemies are going to be taken away from you, and your name is going to be exalted on the earth, Jesus says, ah, <laughs> blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, Blessed are the weeping. Blessed are you who are hated by men, excluded, cast out, and reviled. This is not what the people expected. And it's certainly not what the people wanted. It's not what you want. It's not what I want. Nobody wants it. Horrible thing. But it is nevertheless what the people needed. And it comes from a place of love. Notice this very touching verse, the beginning there in verse 20. Jesus lifted up his eyes towards his disciples. Here is love come in the flesh. And he looks on those beloved disciples. And he knows the longings of their hearts. He knows their desires. He knows their pains. He knows their griefs. And he knows everything they want to hear from him. But with love, he must speak the truth to them. Right? He knows the pattern, the real pattern that is presented by Moses. What is it? That Joseph first must go down to the prison. He must first go down to the pit before he is exalted. That Israel must first go down to Egypt before they are lifted up to the land of promise. That even Israel must first go through the curses before they are brought into the blessing. Moses makes provision on Mount Ebal where the curses are pronounced where is the altar built? Is it on the Mount of Blessing? No, it's on the Mount of Curses. God builds an altar. Sacrifices are offered up. Praise and worship to God on the Mount of Curses. And Moses says as much in his book that the people will rebel. They will be cursed. But nevertheless, through curse, through death, the people will be gathered, restored, and brought to a place of blessing by God. Jesus knows the pattern of the prophets. He knows Ezekiel all too well. He is the son of man. I think the book of Ezekiel is in the background of the Messiah's life more than we realize. The first half of the book of Ezekiel is, a, is judgment and death to, to, to Israel, to Jerusalem. And then after Jerusalem falls and the temple is destroyed, the second half is all about resurrection and life. But that's the pattern. Jerusalem and Israel must first go through death. They must first be cursed if they are to be brought to a place of blessing, of life and salvation. He knows the pattern of Jonah the prophet. Jonah first had to go to his watery grave until he was raised up again by God. And he knows, and this is perhaps the most important thing, 
He knows his own life. He knows why he has come to this earth. He's come to a place of poverty. He himself will hunger. He will bear the affliction of his people. He will be brought to tears weeping over the sins of Israel, over the death that touches humanity that ought not to be. He will be reviled. He will be excluded. He will be rejected and abandoned by his own people. He will be strung up on a cross and he will bear the curses of the law for his people. He will go down to the grave and taste death and then he will rise up again having swallowed it up for all of his people and proclaim life and hope and salvation to them. He knows all of this. And so he looks at the people. They want to hear a different story but he knows the pattern of Moses. He knows the pattern of the prophets. He knows the pattern of his own life. And as he looks at them, he knows exactly what they're going to have to go through as his own people. He knows they follow where he has gone. They too must bear their cross. It's totally counterintuitive, but we must go through approximate curse in order to arrive at a place of blessing. We must go through death in order to arrive at a place of life. Now, if Jesus won, objectively, he has accomplished our salvation. The question is, why should it be this way? And I want you to think about the ways in which uh, God uses suffering in order to bring about good. And think about it especially through the lens of Jesus' own life. So, of course, the big one is through Jesus' death, salvation comes to the world. And that's all too often the case in our lives. We are brought to rock bottom, and that is the point at which we come to God in faith and we are raised up again. Suffering is used for discipleship. Hebrews 5.8, Jesus learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Jesus learned what it meant for his human will to be in accord with the divine will, and it meant suffering and self-denial, and for us, it's the same. All of the misery, all of the heartache that God brings into our life, he uses like fire to refine us, to humble us, to create within us a pure heart and a clean spirit. He uses suffering for friendship. There's a beautiful verse, Hebrews 2 and verse 10, for it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. But listen, for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them his brethren. In Christ suffering for us and then in us suffering for Christ, we're brought into a a, a friendship and a union with him. He's not ashamed to be called our older brother. And you'll know that in your own life in common experience. When you go through terrible things and you find somebody else who's also gone through a similarly terrible thing, it creates within you a profound bond and understanding. Suffering is used for salvation, for sanctification, and even for friendship. Now then, here's the question. Which is better? Is it better for God simply to reach down and to snatch us out from evil and darkness and allow evil and darkness to go its own way? Or is it better for God to redeem even the evil and even the darkness? Which more displays the preeminence of Jesus Christ? Is it that he should lift us out from the pit or that he should transform the pit into light? See, this is the profound glory, the wisdom, and the beauty of God in Jesus Christ, that he not only conquers our enemies there through his own life and the cross and the resurrection, but through the lives of his people, he continues to allow us to go through darkness, and then he demonstrates to the world how the darkness can be turned into light. This is the glory of Christ, preeminent even in human suffering. And I would much rather have that. When you read the news, and you'll have read this week of those dear children who died in a frozen lake in Solihull, 
do you really want to believe that that was for nothing? That there is no good that can come out of that tragedy? No, that is a pitiful and it is a depressing view of the world. But the hope-filled, glorious view of the world is that even the worst of human suffering is turned around for life, for goodness, for love, for glory. God redeems our suffering. Now, does this mean that every one of us are going to suffer all of these things all of the time? Are we all always going to be in poverty, always weeping, always hungry, always despised by men? Well, no, self-evidently that's, that's not true because we have multiple examples of people prospering in the Scriptures. We have the counterbalance of still that traditional sense of God blessing, obedience. We have our own human experience. But what it does mean is that when we find ourselves in this place, we shouldn't be surprised and we shouldn't be sad. Here are these ordinary people whose lives have come into contact with the Savior. They've begun in this profound and amazing way, and they want to believe with our Pentecostal friends that from here on out, it's going to be like gold and jewels and nice clothing and great food, and all of their troubles are going to be taken away. But Jesus loves them too much to allow them to believe that lie. He's going to first allow them to take the cross and to walk the path that he has walked, that he would show them his glory, even in redeeming human suffering. This is the way of the disciple. Our way is the way of the cross. Now, it's not always that. Secondly, then, we consider our caution. Because here's the thing, and I think somebody who's more optimistic than me would say Nathan's just depressed. And so he always focuses on suffering in the Christian life. And and they say, and that's not where I am. You know, my life is pretty good. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff. I'm happy. I'm content. I've got a great family. I've got a great work. You know, everything is just fantastic. Well, all right. Mr. Optimist, Mrs. Optimist, wherever you are, I've got a word for you too. Jesus has. And do you know what the word is? Woe! (laughs) Woe! Woe to you. Woe to you, he says, who are rich. Woe to you, who are full. Woe to you who laugh now. And woe to you when all men speak well of you. Now, if you found yourself in a place of prospering, don't run for the hills. He's not saying you can't be rich, full, merry and well-regarded, and still be blessed by God. I mentioned before there are examples in the Scriptures. Think about Abraham, very rich, very blessed man, happy, content with God too. You think of Job, and I know he actually went through the pattern of death and resurrection, but both at the beginning and at the end, he is an incredibly rich and full and happy man before God. Think of Philemon, um, that man that Paul writes the letter to, you know, concerning the runaway slave. Philemon is wealthy, and with all of his wealth, he blesses the Christians. He receives missionaries. He sends them on the way. Think about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector. He's an example of somebody who is abundantly blessed with wealth and also abundantly blessed with grace. And he gives half of his possessions to the poor and he conducts his business with uprightness and justice. And so Jesus is not saying, run for the hills if everything is great. But what he is saying to you is this, be careful. Be careful. If the conditions of curse can become a blessing, as I argued in the first point, then blessing in the traditional sense can very easily become a curse. Blessing in the traditional sense can very easily become a curse. And God warned his people of this, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 10. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. And do you know what? This is exactly, exactly what Israel did. Ezekiel chapter 7 and verse 19 says this. 
And here he is talking about the downfall of Jerusalem. They will throw their silver into the streets, and their gold will be like refuse. Their silver and their gold will not be able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They will not satisfy their souls, nor fill their stomachs. Why? Because it became their stumbling block of iniquity. Do you see that? All of the blessings that God gave to Israel became to them a stumbling block of iniquity. And it's this that we've got to watch out for. John learned a similar lesson recently. Um, He was given a lovely advent calendar by his grandma, uh, this wooden calendar, uh, and it was filled with scripture verses and a little toy and a chocolate. Great calendar, fully intended to bless little John's life. But you know what he did? Like a little greedy piggy, while nobody was watching, he opened 17 windows or so, scoffed the chocolates, then had some tree chocolates. And unfortunately for John, as he discovered what was intended to be a blessing to him, became a curse because he puked that night. He couldn't have chocolate the next day in case it made him sick again. And he had the disappointment of 17 empty windows to look forward to. And every day he knows the ones that are empty. And so he goes, can I open this one instead? And he tries to skip ahead to the one that still has a chocolate. But this is the frustration of sinful and stupid humanity. We rarely receive gifts without corrupting them. This is the problem. All right. So great if we're rich. Great if we're full. Great if we can laugh. Great if we even can be well regarded by men. And some people do that well. But look at your life. Think about the times when you have most earnestly hungered and sought the Lord. Most zealously pursued his name and desired to have him in your life. Has that been at times of prosperity or at times of poverty? Has it been in times of desperation or in times of plenty? And you know full well that it is always when God brings you to the very bottom that you have most urgently, most hopefully sought after his name. Now that doesn't mean, as I say, that you can't be blessed and still seek after God. That's the ideal. That's what God wants. God would desire that you as his people would be able to have full tummies and full houses and nice things and live a good life. And because of all of that, be the most fired up to praise and to worship him. But sadly, that's not what happens. And when we allow our blessings to strangle earnest faith, the Lord who loves us too much to leave us in that place of faithlessness and carnality will lead us down hard and dark paths until he brings us back to our greatest blessing, which is found in knowing and serving and delighting in him. So we got to be careful. Now, what if we never learn the lesson? And this is the vast majority of most people. What if we take from God and receive without any repentance, and any worship. Jesus says two things. First, he says, stand back and look at everything in your life today and ask yourself the question, are you satisfied? God has designed us with greater needs to know him and to be filled in the depth of our soul. But if you stand back and you look at everything in your life today, would you be satisfied if this was everything? Because what Jesus says is, this is the best it's ever going to be if you do not learn the lesson. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation as good as it's going to get. Worse, if we forget the name of the the Lord our God, our creator, and the one who offers redemption and salvation to us, he says it's only going to get worse. Right now might be a time of relative prosperity, but what lies ahead, what does he say? Is hunger and mourning and weeping. You have to look no further than the story of the rich man and Lazarus. That rich man who every day went to his big house with his nice clothes and his lovely food. But then he passed to the place of suffering and of torment. And he pleaded with God that even his brothers would be warned for the misery that fell upon him. If we are prospering, 
but not praising. We need to be very careful. We need to remember the Lord who prospers us. We need to praise his holy name. You imagine a father who has a house full of, of kids and, and every single day he, he goes out and he works 12 hours in order to provide for them. And he leaves them at home and whenever he comes back from work, they, they've had a party and they've invited their rogue friends around and they've trashed the house and they've torn down the wallpaper and they've spilled beer on the carpet. But every single day he goes out and he labors and he works and he gets up again and he keeps loving them and he keeps putting food on the table for them. But no matter how much he does, they continue to spit in his face to disregard his rules. This is what sinners are doing to God. And eventually, ultimately, if they do not learn the lesson now to remember the God who has blessed them, then they will experience in full measure the curse of God when it falls upon them. So we live between two realities. You know, compared to the rest of the world, we're pretty wealthy. Compared to the rest of the country, we're probably quite poor. And our lives fluctuate between those two realities. At times we are on and feeling the full weight of the cross, bearing the cross, and we need to know that's okay. This is the way that Christ has gone and this is the right path to follow. And at other times, we're going to experience um, prosperity and things are going to be better for us. We just got a nice new house and, um, and we've got some nice new jobs and, and all of the rest. But then you've got to remember, don't forget the praise and the worship of God. If you're prospering, let it fuel your praise. If you're in poverty, rejoice. You're walking the path of Christ. And then this is the final thing, our welcome. See, what I haven't addressed yet is where the blessing lies. When Jesus says, blessed are you poor, blessed are you who hunger, blessed are you who weep, and blessed are you despised of men, how can he say that? Why does he commend such a life to these people? Misery is all they've ever known. How can he be blessed to experience more misery, more privation? Why is it that even Jesus himself chooses this life? And he does. Well, it's certainly not because today is poverty and hunger and weeping, rejection, excluding, and shame. And we are blessed when we experience these things. Why? Because, because of what will be. Notice this is where Jesus places all of the attention and the reward and the hope. Blessed are you, poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you, hunger, na hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Why? Because it's amazing to suffer? No. Because great is your reward in heaven. The great reward, the great salvation that God has prepared for us lies in the future. This is why we rejoice to suffer today, not for what we experience, but for, for what we will experience when Christ returns. And he's not just speaking here of opposite human experiences. It, it looks that way. But what he is doing is he is drawing on the language of the prophets, the language of the gospels, and the language of the epistles that describe the full salvation of God like a wedding banquet, a time of feasting, a flowing wine, of singing, of celebration, of dancing, and merriment. And he's not literally saying to his people that when salvation comes, every single day will be a wedding day. What he is saying is you imagine the highest and the happiest and the most blessed of all human experience, and then imagine that even better and for all eternity. That is the salvation that I have prepared for you, and it flows out of one happy union of when God and man are fully and truly reconciled, when you are brought into full communion with the Lamb of God. And what Jesus is saying is this, that that future glory that lies ahead is clearly better and clearly makes up for every distress that we experience in the present age. That's what Jesus is saying. 
no matter how bad it gets today, and it got really bad for Christians who were crucified upside down, burned at the stake, who saw loved ones thrown into prison, fed to lions. But for all of that, he says, it is totally, totally worth it because what lies ahead is beyond your imagination. And do you know how we know this to be true? Because Jesus, who came from God, who planned it all, chose the way of the cross for the joy that was set before him. He knew how good it was, and it was worth his own death on the cross. And then he encouraged us as his people. Why should we take the way of the cross? Why should we bear the weight of the cross? Because of the welcome that awaits us. Christmas is a magical time of year. And one of the best things about Christmas and about winter is the contrast. It's going out for a cold, uh, for a cold walk on a snowy day in the dark. And it's returning home to a house that is filled with light and warmth and family and food and joy and celebration. And this is us now. We're out there in the winter and the dead of night. And we slip and we stumble on the ice and the cold penetrates our bones. And there's a great deal of darkness. But we keep going in faith because we know that this glorious welcome awaits. This home and family that goes beyond anything that our minds can comprehend. And so Jesus, you see, he looks up in verse 20 with his eyes set on his beloved people. And he knows what they want to hear. They want to hear, look, you're not going to cry again. You're not going to be up in the night with anxiety and troubled in your soul. You're not going to be worried about next week and next month. But I love you too much to lie to you. The truth is you will. Where I have gone, you must go too. And I'll show you how even the darkest night can be redeemed in my glorious power and how we can transform it into light. But what is even more is, dear little flock, keep going because what awaits is this welcome. I can't fully describe it to you now. It goes beyond the best of human experience. But it, it awaits you, this family and eternal home of all joy, of all love, and of all peace. And so, flock, he says, I've got to go there too. I'm about to go to Jerusalem, or I will, and I don't want to go, but I'm going to go because it's worth it. And you must follow me. Let's go together. And he says to us this morning, I've been there. <laughs> I've come out the other side. And my spirit now even more strongly, more firmly commends to you. It would be worth your entire life to inherit what I have prepared for you. And so, come on. I've gone ahead. I'll go with you. Let's keep going together. No matter how poor, no matter how hungry, no matter how much weeping, no matter how much rejection, great, great is your reward in heaven. Amen.